A very warm welcome to each of you and a special welcome to those who may be tuning in for the first time. This is the Voice of Truth uh, program coming your way and uh, I'm your host Paul Fry. Just delighted to have this privilege of spending uh, this time with you as we look into the Word of God. For the Word of God is the instruction book for life. Today I'd like to talk to you about a miracle that our Lord performed near the end of his earthly ministry. All through the years of his uh, earthly ministry, he performed miracle after miracle, all of a beneficent nature. In other words, it all was of some goodness and mercy, whether it was the making the blind to see or on stopping the ears of the deaf, um, cleansing the leper, making the lame to walk, or raising the dead. There was always an act of mercy in the miracle that he performed. But now, with just a few days remaining in his earthly <coughs> sojourn before the cross, he would perform his last miracle, unlike all the others. It was a miracle of which, instead of blessing, it was a miracle of cursing. In other words, it was a miracle that indicated judgment. And I would like to <clears throat> just get, before I read the text that we will speak from today, I'd like to give a little of the background. Our Lord had, in the last months, was running into very hostile, op hostile opposition. In John 8 and verse 59, he made this statement to the Pharisees and scribes. He said, before Abraham was, I am, using the same title that Jehovah gave Moses back in Exodus 3.14. And when he said that, they picked up stones to stone him. Then in chapter 10, where he, in a parable, <clears throat> shows himself as the good shepherd, he said these words, I and my father are one, John 10.31, and again, they picked up stones to stone him. But now in the last week, the first day of the last week, he had gotten on <clears throat> the colt of full of an ass and made his triumphal journey into Jerusalem. And along the way, they proclaimed him, Hosanna, <clears throat> Hosanna to the king, <clears throat> to the son of David, to the king of Israel. Multitudes came from everywhere and they just proclaimed and shouted shouts of joy that the king had come. And when he went into Jerusalem, he looked at it and he wept over the city because Jerusalem, the people knew not the day of their visitation or that that was made for their peace. And then the account tells us that he went a uh, clean, cleaned house in the temple. They were using it as a house of merchandise instead of a house of prayer. It was Passover week. And so they were using it to merchandise and selling the lambs and those animals used for sacrifice, the changing of money, but it was all for profit. And he cleaned house. And then he went back to Bethany. And I like to say this, of all the places that our Lord <clears throat> uh, visited in the days of his earthly sojourn, there was only one little place in Bethany where he could found, where he found a refuge for his weary physical body, where he found, where he knew he was wanted. It was the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so he spent the evening there and then he came out to go to Jerusalem again early the next morning. And that's where I'd like to read, beginning at Matthew 21 and um, <clears throat> verse 18. It says this, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Let's go back to that morning. It's now the second day of the week, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem. No doubt early in the morning, he said he was hungry. And I asked myself the question, why was he hungry? 
and no doubt he was hungry because he did not take time to eat breakfast. And it was a custom in Palestine, and certainly in Israel, to plant fig trees along the way so the wayfarer might have something to quench his hunger. And uh, so when he saw this fig tree in the distance alongside the road, which was there for wayfarers to partake of, when he got close to it, he saw it only had leaves on it. Now, let me give you a little bit of background for the fig tree. Fig trees usually bear fruit in June, and always the fruit comes first, not the leaves. The leaves come after the fruit. But here it is in April, Passover week, and here this fig tree was in leaf, but of course no fruit. And this account which I just read to you is <clears throat> a parable in action because the Lord wanted to convey some deep spiritual truth before he went to the cross and left his own. And um, let me ask this question. What does the fig tree symbolize? You see, a parable is when an event is taken from the common ordinary life or something from nature to <clears throat> convey a spiritual and heavenly truth. And so we know that the Lord had something much deeper in mind. The fig tree, of course, was of no use. If it did not bear any fruit, a fig tree of just leaves was no use. So uh, that's one reason for the curse, but that's not the reason that he wants us to know. First, let's uh, understand who the fig tree represented. It represented Israel. In 1 Kings 4.25, it speaks about everyone sat under his fig tree. And that language is used throughout the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, again, uh, there is a parable of the fig tree very similar to this in Luke chapter 13, verse 6. And also, again, in, um, in Matthew 21, uh, 20, uh, 24, 29, and uh, also in Mark chapter 2. But it is referring that the fig tree is symbolic of the nation of Israel. Now, we have already spoke a little bit about the nature of the fig tree, that it bears fruit first before the leaf. But now we know that the Lord wanted to convey a spiritual truth about Israel. National Israel I'm talking about. Not all that are in Israel, but the national Israel. Now, how was Israel, how was Judah when the Lord came from heaven to earth? Well, Israel was looking for its Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 19, they questioned uh, John the Baptist, whether he was that prophet, whether he was the Messiah that the Scriptures spoke about. But the Scriptures tell us this. He was in the world. He made the world, and the world knew him not. It says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. What was the problem? The problem was that Israel as a nation was without spiritual light. Isaiah 9, 2, prophesying of this, said they <clears throat> sat in darkness, where in the area of Galilee, they sat in darkness until the light shined upon them. How were they as a nation? What did the leaves represent? This is why I'm talking about. The leaves represented the state of Israel. It was a state in, it was a state of, uh, of the people in hypocrisy. Let me read what our Lord said. He says this, outwardly, he says, you appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Oh, you're zealous for the ceremonial law, but you've omitted the weightier, weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. The fig leaves only represent an empty profession. And the title of this message is Profession Without Possession. They were so zealous for the law. They tithed and mint and cumin and every little thing, but there was no mercy there. They were caught up in religious formalism. And as the state of Israel was then, so is the state of the church today in large measure. Someone has said that you look historically at Israel and look historically at the church, and it's like looking in a mirror and seeing your own reflection. For you see, the fig leaves without their fruit is a picture of one who professes God, one who professes Jesus Christ 
and does not possess the life that's in Jesus Christ. For you see, if you have spiritual life, then you have to reflect the person who gives spiritual life, and only God can give that because all descendants of Adam are born spiritually dead. And the same is true in the Old Testament as in the New Testament as in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, David, Isaiah, uh, <clears throat> Asa, all these great men, Josiah, all these great men, they believed in the Messiah. Like Job, that patriarch of old, he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now that in the latter day shall, he shall stand upon the earth, and in my flesh I shall see God. Job believed in a Redeemer. Ever since that <clears throat> pronouncement was made in the Garden of Eden, uh, the uh, man was promised that there would be a Redeemer come to rescue man from his fallen state, separated by sin from a holy creator, holy God who is our creator. But to get a better understanding of the fig leaves that so characterized national Israel, we'd have to go to, Exodus, uh, to Genesis chapter 3. You remember there in the dawn of human history, there in the garden where the first assault was made upon the family of man, uh, Eve was a target of the enemy's <clears throat> uh, testing. They succumbed to his temptation, his testing, and they both fell. And as soon as they fell, that robe of innocence that had covered them was removed, and they saw that they were naked. And what did they do? They made aprons of fig leaves to cover their physical nakedness, but spiritually it was to cover their spiritual shame. And man down through the ages has tried to find acceptance with God by the spiritual leaves of his work, of his works, trying to come up with something or trying to <clears throat> become involved in some religious activity, some religious work to find himself, make himself acceptable to God. But the Bible makes it very clear that all our good works are as filthy rags before God's holiness. You see, it's sin that has separated, and that's why Jesus came. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, and no fig leaves of our self-righteousness or works is going to be acceptable with God. <clears throat> Even in the New Testament, you see churches that represented national Israel, the church at Crete, Oh, they professed that they knew God, but in works they denied Him. Yes, their works were abominable, and every good, every good work reprobate. Then the church at Sardis, they had quite a reputation. They were well known in the community. Oh, they had a name, but you know what the Lord Jesus said when He tested the seven churches there in the book of Revelation? He said, you're dead. You don't have the spiritual life. And the church of Jesus Christ, I'm talking about as a whole, not as individuals. The church of Jesus Christ today is like the fig leaves that represented national Israel. Fig leaves, a lot of religious activity. Never has there been a day when there's been more seminars, more church programs, more singing, more preaching. <clears throat> there's never been a time more, uh, uh, more Bible studies, but yet so little life, so little life. Why is it? because man has deceived himself in the church that if they go to church and put in their hour, two hours a day, then just get on with life as you maybe get involved in a little re religious activity. But the spiritual fruit that our Lord was looking for in Israel was the fruit that reflected the nature and the character of God. And what is the nature and the character of God? The Lord makes it very plain. He said, I am the Lord who exercises this justice, mercy, and goodness on the earth. And these things I delight, saith the Lord. None of that was seen as a whole. Yes, and one here and one there, but not, not as a whole. And that's the way the church is disintegrating today. No longer reflecting the life of its master, no longer reflecting the character of Jesus Christ in goodness, love, gentleness, mercy, meekness. Oh, there are sure those individuals, but not as the church as a whole. 
It's content to be satisfied with the fig leaves of its righteousness and its, of, of its works. Let me give you an illustration how important this is to my own heart. Several years ago, I went in a home to visit a family. The mother and the children went to church. It doesn't mean that they had gone beyond the fig leaves of their own works, but they did attend church. And I went to see the father, the husband, and after a few pleasantries were exchanged, he very boldly and very directly said, he said, you know, you Christians are a bunch of phonies. And I looked back at him eyeball to eyeball very kindly and I said, you know, in many cases you're absolutely right. A phony is a pretender to be something that he is not. That's a hypocrite. But I also added this, and I added to any of you who are watching today, that on Judgment Day, you'll never be able to find a hypocrite so big enough to hide behind. For each one of us must give an account of his own life. Each one of us will bend the knee. Each one of us will confess with the tongue and give an account to God, our Creator, our Maker. And you know the wonderful thing is that we can stand before Him, not be condemned, if we have the life of Christ in us, if we have his spirit dwelling in the sanctuary of our heart, born again, that's what, the, that's what the life is, to have his life. And that comes when there is a turning away, a 180 degree turn from the old life of rebellion against God, but now acknowledging the righteous demands of the law and submitting to the holy rule of the king. That's the only way you enter the straight gate that leads to life. No one is going to enter into the kingdom by making a, a cheap profession of faith without surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ who died for the sins of sinners that he came to save. And as we <clears throat> go on, and then to reinforce what I just said, last week I received a call from a man out of state, 73 years old, and this is what he said to me. He said, I went to my pastor. At the age of 18, he had come to the Lord but in all those years, 55 years, he came to the conclusion that he was a phony. And I know pretty well this man's life, and that is one thing I'd never hear come from his lips. But if he could say that I'm a phony, I thought of all the others in church that go through the religious activity, uh, uh, almost perfunctory, just sit there, sit, soak, and sour, and they don't like what the church has to offer. They go to another church until they get the spiritual entertainment that they want. That's a fig leaves of a false profession, dear ones. And as we hasten on, <clears throat> we'd like to just look a little bit at what it says here about, uh, and the disciples, when they saw it, they marveled. I'd like to just share this, the instruction from this um, parable that was uh, in the action of a miracle. Have you noticed the power and the authority of the king when he spoke, let no more fruit ever come upon thee, and immediately the roots dried up? There's something we need to know. We may laugh and make fun of this book. We may ridicule it. And we might uh, find great delight in saying separation of church and state will not have any Ten Commandments around or anything like that. No prayer and score, no Bible reading, anything like that. Removing everything, every vestige of God and His Word. Listen, Abraham, I mean George Washington said, it's impossible to govern without God and the Bible. Our forefathers had some understanding of who God is and who the Savior is. And so, and I would just like, and the instruction of this parable is the absolute authority of God's word when he speaks. It is so. And only a fool will turn his eyes away or his ears away from hearing the word of God, which is absolutely authoritative. He will judge us in the last day. That's the way we'll be judged according to his word. You're either going to stand before the king with the empty leaves of a false profession, like in this case, national Israel, or are you going to stand before him clothed not in the fig leaves of your works, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which he gives to those whom he gives his life? Secondly, he spoke about faith. 
Israel had become faithless as a nation. They became, they rested their security upon that, that they were the descendants of, of Abraham, and they rested their <clears throat> security in the fact that they had the law and that they were the chosen people. But let me tell you something. Unless you're basing your faith upon the authority of Scripture, you have no faith. Faith is only as good as the authority that it's based upon. The Word of God is authoritative, and you cannot separate God from His Word. And so our Lord says here about the um, uh, having a faith, He says, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. So they would soon be the communicators of the gospel, which is still the power of God unto salvation. So they would go forth preaching the gospel in faith, believing upon the authority of the word that they were preaching. And so when he was speaking about these impossible things that would happen, he was speaking about, yes, those <clears throat> mountains that stand in our way sometimes in our earth, earthly life, sometimes are tests, sometimes are trials, but he wants us to rest in the authority of the Word of God. When we proclaim the gospel, he wants us to rest in the authority of the scriptures, that they are able to bring conviction of sin as the Holy Spirit applies the Word to the heart. And then um, there's three things I'd like you to keep in mind regarding whether you, ha whether you have just profession only or whether indeed you possess the Lord Jesus Christ. First is absolute faith in the authority of the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Secondly, prayer. He mentioned here prayer. There's no use you pray unless you have faith in what God has said. And so you have the, um, you have the power of faith, you have the power of prayer, and then you have the fruit of an obedient life. Those three go together. I'd like to share also something regarding back to um, when our Lord went into uh, Bethany to find that little high oasis, just a little place of refuge that he could have before <clears throat> uh, he would go to the cross. I'd like to make a spiritual application. In that little house in Bethany, he found a little refuge for his weary body. The question I'm going to ask you today is, can he find a refuge a Bethany refuge in the sanctuary of your heart? Can he feel at home in your heart by his spirit? Or is your heart hardened by the things and the fashions and the glitter and the standards of this world? Has that captured your heart? Or can the Lord Jesus, may his spirit find a refuge in the sanctuary of your heart? Can he find a Bethany rest? in the sanctuary of your heart as he found a Bethany of rest for his weary body there um, on that night before he went back into Jerusalem in the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. That fig tree, the last of his miracles, isn't it interesting that it was a judgment? He wanted us to see that that parable that he spoke, spoke of judgment upon those who claim to be Christians without spiritual life. That's what he was driving home. That was true of national Israel, and it's true of many in the church today. So how in the world can one then bear fruit? How can one have this life? How can one have this evidence that he has a profession with possession, that he possesses the spirit of the living Christ. Well, I referred to it earlier, Gone. Until we acknowledge the righteous demands of the law of God, the Creator, until we recognize his holiness that demands judgment upon lawlessness, until we recognize that there is no escape from that judgment except in and through the one who came 
to be the suffering substitute for sinners like you and I. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We earn the wages of death because we're all sinners, all lawless in God's court of heaven. We're all criminals. But the Lord Jesus in his humanity could legally, he fulfilled the law, so therefore he could go and be the substitute for sinners suffering in our place, suffering for our sins, suffering for the wrath of God. The, the justice of God was exacted there on the hill called Calvary because sin had to be judged and he judged sin in his well-beloved son. Do you have, dear ones, the life of Christ in you? Have you ever come to the straight gate? Have you ever laid down the weapons of your warfare hostile to the Word of God? Have you laid that down? Have you surrendered to His holy rule? No one will gain entrance into that straight gate that leads to life, the narrow road that leads to life, until you come the way the Bible says. He invites you today to come just as you are, to come to lay down your sins at the foot of the cross, and then by faith trust His work on the cross for your salvation, and then cast yourself under His holy rule. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see our address, you'll see our telephone number. We have a lot of literature that we love to give out that is free. Uh, we also make available these, uh, VC, uh, these messages that are broadcast um, over Public Access TV on tapes. We have them on tapes available. Both are free, no charge. We just uh, love to give out the Word of God, which is true. And if those of you would want a veil of these messages on tape, that too is free. Just please uh, call uh, the telephone num number listed at the bottom of your screen or write to the address there, po Voice of Truth, P.O. Box 1376, Manhasset, New York, 11030. Thank you. And may God bless you till we meet again. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin.